Thank you for a wonderful introduction, Roman. Not that I understood very much of it, but I'm sure it's a good one. <laughs> Uh, we had the pleasure of getting this grant. It has been really a nice cooperation, and I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about um, when designers are librarians, because um, we have adopted design thinking uh, as an approach to innovation in library, and I just want to tell you the story about this. Uh, it's not a straightforward story, but I hope you will enjoy at least parts of it. Okay. So I will first tell you about how I ended up doing um, uh, design thinking for libraries and how we came to understand design thinking in the library. Uh, I'm talking about University of Oslo Academic Library uh, mostly. And then I want to address how it is um, to innovate in the library and connect this process of design thinking and innovation to some inherent barriers to innovation and design thinking in the library, because it's not so easy to adopt and accept this process. Um, I think it's very important to say that my uh, talk is actually really just an introduction to the main talk, which is um, uh, Andreas, it comes after the break. Um, and he will talk about concrete examples of how we have um, implemented design thinking in the library. I will mostly cover the unpleasant grounds of how to get there. Okay, so um, my field is interaction design and I work at Institute of Informatics in a group uh, for design, use and interaction with technology. I have been teaching interaction design for 13 years and that was my entrance to the projects with library as well, through Andrea, who took his uh, course with me in 2009. And Andrea works for University of Oslo Library Digital Services. And in 2009, um, they had these ebook readers, and we were wondering what to do with those and what kind of thing we could um, <laughs> test with ebook readers. So we went to a class in a children's school, uh, fourth grade. And we wanted them to make or design a digital library for children that we could implement on these ebook readers. So that was the first project. And then I thought, wow, this is cool. Library is really innovative. I never thought about it that way. But, you know, this is pretty radical. The children um, doing, designing, deciding how they would like to read books, children's books from ebook reader. Then in 2010, the iPads came, and University of Oslo Library surprised me again because they went for this big project with iPads, where they purchased iPads to, for an um, entire course in geophysics and placed all the expensive uh, curriculum that they have and all the expensive maps that these people usually use in their studies on the iPad. And we were going to see how this reduces the use of paper and how people use this new technology to support their studies. So that was great, we did a study. Uh, of course, the iPads didn't work for these students, but that's besides the point. It was fun. Um, in 2011, um, the library came back with yet another big project because um, up until that point they usually they had most of their things and services on a website and uh, in 2010 2011 all these apps came in and the library then wanted to use my course for innovation and innovation meant let's make many apps okay we did that so we had um, um, I, I just had one picture because this is like a storyboard um, <laughs> um, we had one um, app for uh, calling the uh, reference librarian to help when you need it. You could use it in the library or could, you could schedule appointment in advance. Very simple. Um, then in 2012, we got really a lot more complex with all this design that we were doing. And uh, this was an app for booking the rooms in the library. Um, that also had um, um, a social function, because Facebook was very big at that time. So the iPads were hanging outside of each room in the library, and they showed who is inside. 
um, their Facebook picture and the, the topic of what they were doing in that room. So the idea was that you could walk in and make some new friends that way. So you post, I'm working on interaction design, and person passing by says, oh, look. So that was cool. And then in 2013, we decided that, yeah, focus on innovation is a good way to go. Let's go do that. And in 2013, um, living labs were really big. I don't know if any one of you worked with living labs. But we thought, OK, library is really interested in innovation. The leadership is interested in innovation. So we will try to turn the library into a living lab, have students and researchers and designers uh, go in and work with people and make new cool stuff. Um, and actually, that also kind of failed. Uh, so it turned into this design thinking approach that became really popular at that time. And then Andrea started his PhD and we decided, well, this is what we are going to research really in depth. We are going to see how to introduce design thinking to libraries and how to actually make it stick as a practice. So um, you will hear the final report, as I said, from Andrea. But um, um, I just want to say that you decide that you will implement something. It's really not so easy. It takes a long time. So during these years, from 2009, we have built kind of a long-term relationship. And I still run library projects in my courses. And also the cooperation with interaction design students from bachelor, master, and PhD level, because now there are few of them, uh, has been really helpful for supporting innovation and design thinking processes in the library. So, um, these two fields are not unrelated. As an interaction designer, it's not quite random that you end up being um, design thinker or researcher in design thinking. As an um, interaction designer, we ha I have a long uh, past with working with users. Uh, in our group and in our department, we do participatory design. That's what Scandinavia is very famous for. And we always have focus on users when we do our research. Also, in my particular group, because we do design user interaction, we are also focused on design research. And in particular, to situate the design where we really focus on context. The whole field of interaction design is multidisciplinary. And this makes it easy to adapt techniques to other fields as well. So then, um, design thinking and design research, of course, are as old as humankind. Um, and the design thinking is not um, a new thing that just popped up in 2009 with work of um, um, Tim Brown and Martin Rogers. It has been around for a long time. But what happened in 2009, 2010, it became really um, a tool towards innovation and a tool that management and strategic departments in many businesses adopted as their way forward. Um, working with design thinking, I see that there is two ways to look at it. One way is to work with design thinking as a process, and I think that's what we've just seen the example of in the previous talk. Um, and it rests on these three pillars that you have also seen um, in the previous talk, on empathy, uh, rapid prototyping, and abductive thinking. Um, design consultancies like Aldio, Design It, Frog, etc., use design thinking when working with libraries. At least, that is the case in University of Oslo. I don't know how you work here. If the library needs something new, do they turn to consultancies, or do they do it internally? I do not know. Um, but in 2010, when we started working with 
um, idea of living labs, user-centered design, um, user-driven innovation, etc. I will show you some examples. Um, the library did all of this, but whenever they needed something that they considered really serious, they went back to NetLife Research or to other design agencies. And this is because um, library can be considered actually as a complex system. It is very few things that are simple cut, one thing that you make, a product or a service. Things are interdependent. And when you make one solution, it influences several others in turn. And um, design thinking as a process is maybe relatively easy or simple. We've heard lots of good advice of how to do it. Um, but um, really, uh, design thinking as an approach to complex system design is not so simple. It is terribly messy, ter terribly uncertain, and very difficult to do. So, um, such complex domains in which design thinking has had some success, and it really does have success stories, um, um, are healthcare, education, climate changes, etc. Uh, what uh, characterizes these complex system problems is that they are incomplete often, they are contradictory, and they are interdependent. So poverty and education hang together, so you cannot solve one without addressing the other. So what designers like to say in this situation is that rather than finding a good solution to a given problem, what we want to find is a true problem, real problem, underlying problem to solve. So I want to give you an example of that. This is a company with whom I work. They, um, they are also having student projects from my class often. They are called Design It and they are an international design consultancy. They have had a tremendous success in Norway and they have been uh, really um, gotten a lot of credit, became very well known because they have solved the problem of um, diagnosis of cancer for women, breast cancer. This process was terribly long from the moment a woman would take a biopsy to the day she would get a diagnosis, it took three months. So this company looked at this problem and they solved it, reduced the time to 72 hours. They did not do this phenomenal thing by actually by any kind of fancy design of a new system. What they did is, what I just talked about, look for the underlying problem. And the underlying problem was that the woman was treated as a patient in the first case. And as a patient, all security measures apply, non-disclosure and so on. So they would be sending results by ordinary mail, secured, this, that, long time. So they changed all of this by saying a woman is not a patient. She's not diagnosed yet, therefore she's an ordinary citizen whose records we can send by email. So, um, this just to illustrate how in these complex situations you can cut through the problem, not only by design, but by really considering what is the underlying issue. Um, this is also their photo that illustrates, I think, the same process that you have seen a second ago. <laughs> Um, that uh, design thinking as a process can be seen as consisting of these phases, insight, ideation, and implementation. They can be split into more subparts, like he had five, six, whatever. But this is the main zest of it. Um, the um, um, design thinking work usually actually covers only the first two and the implementation usually takes place in some other way, but is, of course, a necessary part of the process. Okay, so why would one want to do 
uh, design thinking in libraries. This is because libraries actually do want to innovate. Uh, maybe they also have to innovate. And this want to and have to merge together. And in this one particular way, maybe they can make a good process. Uh, what is innovation then? It's important to define it and understand it. So Oslo Manuel defines innovation as the implementation of a new or significantly improved products, goods or services, a new marketing method, or a new organizational method in business practices, workplace organization, or external relations. Our understanding of this process has actually started by thinking about um, innovation of goods and services, and we have ended up innovating the organization, as you will hear later from Andrea. So, just keep in mind <laughs> where this comes from. And for me, in particular, doing the work that I have been doing with the library, I have come to understand design thinking as actually a holistic approach that connects these two things. Because I work on development of new technology, and I'm on this kind of low end of innovation. Um, but by doing that, and doing it consistently, and doing it with the library employees, we have come to see that design thinking has influenced the organizational structure. It has influenced the library's vision, um, leadership, how they know things, and their values and culture. So, um, design thinking for libraries, is it suitable? And why would it be suitable for libraries in particular? Um, as I said, libraries need to innovate. Innovation is, though, messy. And viewed as a process, actually, it has some kind of nice simplicity, challenge. Um, if you do it, you can feel good about the process and you feel like you're contributing. So you can own this innovation in the library. Um, it makes you focus on users. Um, maybe every library is different, but at the library of Oslo, um, they thought they focused on users. But um, this uh, knowledge of user was basically based on questionnaires and um, maybe some observation at the front desk, but actually never really asked users about how they experience services. Um, so change in focus to working with user and having user-focused innovation was actually new, believe it or not. Strange, but true. Um, so design thinking starts with good understanding and empathy for users. It has moved from making for users to making with users in different ways. Um, also, the good thing is designers have developed a powerful tool sets for design with library, like IDEO has uh, done a lot of work. University of Masaryk in Brno has done some tool set development. So there is a lot of help, in particular for libraries. And that's a good thing. These tool sets can be used by designers, but they can also be used by non-designers, by librarians. And this is also what you will hear from Andrea, how we uh, enable or empower uh, the library employees, not just the librarians, but also people who develop technical system, leaders, and so on, to understand design thinking processes and to participate in them in a good way. Um, most importantly, the biggest change that we have seen for all these years of working with design thinking is that the organization has changed. Now, science and design are two different things. They are our two main approaches to solving problems in the real world. The science, you usually ask questions like, why is something like that? You analyze and you... Um, find the truth, 
While designers usually work with questions of how to make, oh, I will construct this, then I will look at it, and then maybe I ch can change something a little bit and get a better solution, they have hands-on maker's approach, and they are capable of seeing connections between things in a way that analysis doesn't show necessarily. Both of these main ways of thinking are really necessary in design thinking processes because you want to open up for innovation, but you also want to converge to a solution and uh, you want to know that this solution is a good one. So you do need both ways of thinking. And this is a quote from uh, Martin Rogers' book, um, Strategy and Leadership, uh, where he says, neither analysis nor intuition alone is enough. In the future, the most successful businesses will balance analytical mastery and intuitive originality in a dynamic interplay that I call design thinking. And for this reason also, it is really good to have teamwork when you're doing um, design thinking, just like Roman said um, some times ago, and how to make teams is also very important. Uh, when focusing on innovation through design thinking, and library is kind of a business, it's a public business, and maybe not so dependent on revenues and so on, but still, money uh, is important. It is important that innovations are adaptable and that they are sound, and maybe also that they are kind of um, longer lasting. I will explain this one a little bit. Um, and so the widely used mental model of how this design thinking is going to work is that the solutions have to be desirable by people, what do people want, both library and the users. Is it feasible? And is it viable as a business um, project? So, innovation can be incremental or disruptive, and the library has seen lately a lot of disruptive innovations, mostly with mobile um, technologies, but maybe first the ebook readers. Um, so, although marketed as a way of creating breakthrough innovation, uh, the studied companies first and foremost use design thinking in incremental innovation settings. This is the analysis of a Swedish uh, new PhD, uh, Lisa Karlgren, and her um, supervisor, Maria Elmquist, who found out uh, she did a study in Silicon Valley of companies that implemented design thinking. And that's her finding. They think they're doing radical innovation, but really, most of them do incremental. And then, um, Innovation can be categorized in many different ways and it depends on what kind of focus you put, what kind of glasses you put on to look at innovation. You can look at it as a product process a position or paradigm innovation, external, internal or hybrid. Or you can also look at who is um, doing the innovation. Is it user driven? Is it user centered? Is it design led innovation, open innovation, living labs, etc. So, I'll just give you two examples of our previous attempts to innovate. And in this case, it was users who were innovators. And this is before we started doing design thinking. So, on the left, there was an app that um, our students made for finding books in the library. So, you use the app and uh, it shows you exactly on what shelf the book is. Um, so this app was implemented and it's used in the library, but the funny thing is, it's librarians that use it to find the books. Um, the other one, uh, Leap Motion came out in 2013, and the students implemented uh, gesture-based scrolling through a small number of books. Typically, this is used by library in conjunction with conferences. When you have, let's say, 10 new books, so you can browse through easily. 
So that was user-driven innovation. The problem with this, as you can see immediately from these two examples, is users see some things, but they don't see everything. They see the front end, but not the back end. So you can have a lot of fun things, 3D printing, this, that, here and there, but not really in-depth, long-lasting innovation. Uh, because they see only a tiny part of what the library does. And then there are barriers to adopting. Uh, this is one next to last slide, so don't worry, it looks like a lot, but I'm almost done. Um, why is it not easy to adopt design thinking in the libraries? Because there are challenges with using design thinking, so being part of the process. And those are that there is difficulty in learning the tools and the mindset of design thinking. Uh, the fact that you're using this approach, tools and methods, doesn't mean you become a designer. And this is hard for some people. Um, perceiving oneself as an innovator, but also perceiving an organization as an innovative organization. Willingness to take the risk or cost that's associated with innovation. Even that little app that finds the book in the library costed quite a lot of money. So things are not free in the library either. Um, then Carl Gren also from her work, she says that uh, there are a lot of adoption barriers, mindset barriers, risk barriers, nascent barriers and infrastructure barriers to adopting radical, you know, to, to doing radical innovation in these silicon companies. Silicon Valley companies. So I was thinking of what of this applies to the libraries. Does do some of these things resonate? And they do. Um, mostly, mindset barriers, risk barriers uh, are the main causes of um, resistance to design thinking in the libraries. And this is the last slide. <laughs> How did we use design thinking and how did we implement it in the library? And as, as I said, Andrea will show you really the pathway and the timeline and talk about examples. But what we did is we started his PhD with a bunch of interviews before design thinking, what people feel and think about uh, design thinking, and then ran a bunch of design interventions, many. Uh, these interventions took form uh, both of workshops, kind of like what you have seen, process of design thinking. Uh, they typically lasted two days and everybody in a specific library was involved in this. We also did some seminars for the library where we had speakers, students present their projects. Um, Lavrance Lovely, who is a design thinker, service designer, come give them a talk and so on. So education and workshops. <laughs> And then we focused on real problems that the library has. And we worked on changing individuals' mindset through these workshops where we kind of eased the way of communicating about the design as much as we could. And we made sure that we followed up these um, innovations so that people don't forget and that they keep on thinking and doing um, design thinking. Uh, that's at the individual side, at the organizational side, we really worked on changing the organizational mindset by changing the organizational, uh, the mindset of the leadership in the library. Uh, by introducing proto-practices, which is prototyping practices in the library, that overlapped with the traditional practices that librarians were doing. So they were not entirely new, but they were somewhat new and exciting. And um, then changing the vision for the library and creating a dedicated space in the library for doing these activities. And so you will see what we accomplished when Andrea gives his talk. Thank you.